Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. At an airport in Heathrow, a young British couple waits for their eight-year-old daughter. Nine months ago, they sent her on a trip to India. They haven't been to the country, but they're sure she's in good hands. After all, she was in the care of her aunts, uncles, and other children. Most importantly, she was in the hands of the one they called mother. Their daughter's plane arrives. They're nervous and excited. They have so many questions. How was school? Did you make any friends? Did you meet her? They watch as passengers exit through the gate. Their daughter barely comes up to their knee, but they expect her to run into their arms. The couple waits. Panic sets in when they don't see their daughter. A million worst case scenarios cross their minds. What if she got on the wrong flight? What if she was kidnapped? Distracted, they bump into someone. The couple look down. It's a small, frightened young girl in rags. Her hair is matted and riddled with lice. Her face and clothes are filthy. Her eyes are cast to the floor. The couple squat down to speak to the girl, who looks up. Their mouths fall open as they recognize the poor girl as their daughter. Once bright, she appears dull and haunted. The couple throw their arms around her. In tears and in shock, they wonder, why didn't mother keep her safe? Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the life of Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi, the venerable Great Mother Immaculate Goddess and founder of the Sahaja Yoga movement. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on your favorite podcast directory or on our website, parcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Tuesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast, and on Twitter at Parcast Network. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. Started during the 1970s in India, Sahaja Yoga boasts an estimated 30,000 to 100,000 members worldwide today. Started by Guru Sri Mataji, Sahaja Yoga is a form of meditation meant to help practitioners unlock an inner awareness. A movement formed around the charismatic leader, morphing Sahaja Yoga into a religious movement that attempted to isolate its members from outside influences, helping them to reach enlightenment. In her lifetime, thousands traveled to meditate with Sri Mataji and release their spiritual energy, called Kundalini, which she claimed could be felt as vibrations on the palms and fingers. This cleared all seven chakras, or energy centers, in pursuit of the true self. Yet ex-members of Sahaja Yoga claim that despite her maternal image, Sri Mataji used their devotion to nurture her own ego. Among her disciples, she instilled a fear of corruption from outsiders and unquestioning devotion as they brought her gifts and prayed to her image. In part one, we'll focus on Sri Mataji, her life, and the influences that led to the creation of Sahaja Yoga. In part two, we'll focus on Sahaja Yoga's spread throughout the globe, its detractors, and why the cult remains strong after Sri Mataji's death in 2011. Like many cult leaders, Sri Mataji has built up an entire mythology around herself and her life. However, there is little factual information about her life prior to the foundation of Sahaja Yoga. One notable source of information on her early life comes from My Memoirs, a book written by H.P. Salve, Sri Mataji's youngest brother and most passionate supporter. Sahaja Yogis affectionately gave her brother the nickname Baba Mama, roughly translated as Mother's Brother. For the rest of this episode, we'll refer to H.P. as Baba Mama. Of course, this source does have some inherent bias, but because it paints such a colorful picture of Sri Mataji's childhood, we'll draw from it occasionally throughout the episode. 
we'll point out places where Baba Mama's memoirs deviate from recorded fact or are largely unlikely. We do know that Nirmala Salve, a.k.a. Sri Mataji, was born in Chindawara, India, on March 21, 1923, to Prasad Salve, a lawyer, and his second wife, Cordelia, the first woman in India to receive an honors degree in mathematics. Both of her parents were Christians and descendants of the royal Salivahana dynasty. Her early years were marked by brushes with death. It started when Sri Mataji was just 15 days old. Family members were taking Sri Mataji to her christening in a horse-drawn carriage when the wheel broke as they were crossing the Bodhi River. The horses kicked up and the carriage split in two. Sri Mataji fell in the crack. When the carriage was dismantled to save her, Sri Mataji emerged unscathed and with a smile. This would not be the only misfortune to plague the family. A month later, spilled kerosene from a lantern started a fire in the right wing of their home. A few months after that, a cousin contracted a fatal illness. <laughs> These events contributed to the idea of bad luck targeting the family. All the women, but Cordelia especially, became extremely protective of their children, with special attention paid to Sri Mataji. Call it superstition or motherly instinct, but her fears turned out to be justified. When Sri Mataji was six months old in 1923, Cordelia took her on a trip to the local bazaar. She placed Sri Mataji on the back seat of the carriage first, then asked the driver to help her inside. As the driver dismounted to assist Cordelia, the horse took off with Sri Mataji. Cordelia and the driver chased the horse as they screamed for help. Meanwhile, the horse was gaining speed. When Cordelia and the driver finally tracked down the wayward horse, they were shocked that it had stopped right at the gate to the house. Sri Mataji was still lying on the back seat, unaffected by her wild ride. Baba Mama said, quote, This is just one event that I've narrated to many a people that shows her divine power, even as an infant. End quote. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. Jared M. Post, director for the political psychology program of George Washington University, describes the properties that define such a relationship between a narcissistic leader and their followers. One such property is that, quote, the leader is perceived by the followers as somehow superhuman. Like all siblings, Baba Mama noticed the favoritism. Quote, I teasingly told my mother that she had different standards, one for the girls and one for the boys. End quote. Social psychologist W. Keith Campbell mentions that parents who put their child on a pedestal can foster grandiose narcissism. In this case, an entire family hails their daughter as a miracle baby for surviving a string of near-death experiences. In 1920s India, Mahatma Gandhi rose up, demanding that India establish its independence from the British. Prasad met Gandhi in 1925, when Sri Mataji was two years old. A nationalist and aware of Gandhi's nonviolent protests, Prasad listened to Gandhi speak about India's enslavement by the British. Gandhi would have a profound impression on Prasad. After he and Cordelia returned from their journey to meet Gandhi, Prasad burned every foreign suit he owned, an act of defiance in front of neighbors and family, likely witnessed by the young Sri Mataji. From that point on, Cordelia and Prasad would only wear clothes made from khadi, a handwoven cloth made in India. Under Gandhi's suggestion, Prasad moved the entire family to Nagpur in 1927, when Sri Mataji was four years old. By 1930, as Gandhi led his famous Dandi march in protest of the British tax on salt, Sri Mataji's parents were fighting for the nationalist movement through politics. Both were busy congressional leaders and unapologetic supporters of Indian independence. As a lawyer, Prasad provided legal aid to fellow Congress members caught up in criminal activity. Both Prasad and Cordelia were in Congress meetings every day. Their open opposition of the British meant they were in and out of jail with arbitrary sentences ranging from a day to a year. 
The family also expanded with the births of two more daughters and Baba Mama. From 1930 to 1933, Sri Mataji took over the household chores from age seven to 10 years old. With so many siblings and a void left by her parents, it isn't hard to see why Sri Mataji wanted to stand out among the crowd. According to Jared Post, while a narcissist may appear dedicated, they ultimately seek attention for their hard work. What better way to do so than by taking on the role of mother? Between 1936 and 1940, when Sri Mataji was between the ages of 13 and 17 years old, her father was elected president of the Nagpur municipality, and the family upgraded to a nicer home. Sri Mataji enrolled into the Bahide Girls High School and would have yet another brush with death. Following a monsoon, a stream had formed in a dry riverbed on the path between Sri Mataji's home and her school. Aware of the danger, the family sent a servant to escort Sri Mataji and her sister home. As they walked, it started to rain again. The servant carried Sri Mataji's sister across the overflowing stream first. But as he turned to go back for Sri Mataji, he was startled by a shout. Sri Mataji had tried to cross by herself, but the strong current swept her away. Fortunately, she spotted a tree and latched on until the servant could pull her out of the water. Though this frightened her sister into taking public transportation, Sri Mataji continued to walk wherever she pleased. One place was the temple of the mother Lodras. Baba Mama says he was Sri Mataji's constant companion on her visits to the temple. Quote, she used to sit in a corner and meditate, or so I thought. But she explained to me that in fact, she used to contemplate how to help the people of the world to get rid of their problems." End quote. The Mother Lodris was worshipped by India's poor, non-Christian community, an image that certainly impressed Sri Mataji to where she would later try to emulate the goddess as the head of Sahaja Yoga. Baba Mama even cited the similarities. Quote, I thought the sculptor must have had Sri Mataji in his imagination, end quote. The idea that Sri Mataji was copying the mother Lodris was probably the case. She would have likely watched as the poor flocked to worship at the feet of the statue, which her disciples would do for her years later. In 1939, the entire family attended the Congress session in Tripuri. Baba Mama said, quote, Though I was just six years old, I vividly remember the mammoth gathering, important leaders, and of course, Gandhi, were seated on the dais, end quote. It was likely a defining moment for a 16-year-old Sri Mataji as well. She would have seen in Gandhi the qualities she sought within herself. Post refers to this as the ideal hungry personality, where narcissistic individuals experience themselves as worthwhile only so long as they can relate to individuals whom they can admire. Sri Mataji would have found such a figure in Gandhi, who was admired not only by her family, but the entire nation. Sri Mataji won over Gandhi while visiting him with her parents. He nicknamed her Nepali, because her physical features reminded Gandhi of the goddess Sita, who was from Nepal. During 1938 to 1939, Sri Mataji became a popular student. Like Cordelia, she showed an aptitude for math. However, popularity could not protect Sri Mataji from the discrimination that came from India's strict caste system. Indian society is divided into four groups based on Brahma, the Hindu god of creation. The four castes are the Brahmin, the priests, Kshatriya, the warriors and nobles, Vaishya, the farmers and traders, and Shudra, the tenant farmers and servants. Those outside of the system were referred to as untouchables, outcasts who endured everything from wage discrimination to murder. The caste system dictated one's social standing, and Sri Mataji was an odd case. Her family's Christian faith technically branded Sri Mataji as an untouchable, yet their wealth and high status allowed her to avoid most of the suffering the average untouchable faced. Still, her classmates expressed their prejudice in small ways. Baba Mama said, quote, The Brahmin girls were afraid to share their lunch with her because she was a Christian, but they loved her very much. They used to hide behind the school and share lunch with her, end quote. It was like the Indian version of Mean Girls. Sri Mataji resented the caste system and clashed with her teacher over it. 
Baba Mama claims that out of spite, the teacher failed her in her final mathematics exam. Sri Mataji protested the decision to her parents, who went to her school principal demanding that he re-examine her test. Her parents' request was denied, so they transferred Sri Mataji to another school, where the principal was a close friend of her father's. Such a friendship had its perks. Sri Mataji received special privileges denied to the other students. For example, the principal would sneak forbidden food to Sri against the rules of the dorm where she lived. This would not be the only time that her parents involved themselves with her education. In 1940, at the age of 17, Sri Mataji suffered a bad fall during badminton and fractured her arm. The accident forced her into a cast. Unfortunately, this happened when she was about to take her college entrance exams. Sri Mataji asked for permission to delay her exams until the cast was off. Once again, her request was denied. Once again, Prasad and Cordelia used their connections to place her in their town's College of Sciences, even though she had not taken her exams. She chose science because she expressed a desire throughout her childhood to become a doctor and help the less fortunate. But at the cusp of a movement for Indian independence, Sri Mataji's own fortunes were about to take a drastic turn. Our story will continue in a moment after a brief message. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. Hi there, I'm hosting a brand new show on Parcast called Mythology. It dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. I've already listened to part one, and I can't wait for part two. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythology's part one on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. And now back to the story. Sri Mataji wanted to dedicate her life to helping people, but soon it would be her own family in need of help. The family's association with Gandhi put them in a difficult situation in August 1942 when he launched the Quit India movement. That same month, Prasad resigned as public prosecutor and climbed atop the high court to tear down the British flag. For this display, he was shot. Though he did not die, Prasad was bleeding from the head. Nevertheless, he raised India's flag and saluted it with Vande Mataram, the anthem of India's nationalist movement. When he returned home, Prasad told Cordelia to prepare a rice dish for the police and told the children to go see a movie. Sri Mataji and the other children left, but Baba Mama stayed. When the police arrived, Prasad asked Baba Mama to fetch his siblings. With the servant at his side, Baba Mama dashed off to the theater. Now remember, this was the time when film was on reels. So Baba Mama asked the theater manager to interrupt the movie with a slide that read, P.K. Salve is being arrested. His children should return home immediately. At this point in his law career, Prasad was a noted public prosecutor famed for his cases, as well as his opposition toward the British. So upon the news of his arrest, the entire theater audience left with their children out of respect. A 19-year-old Sri Mataji would sing Vande Mataram with her family as Prasad was arrested. With her father imprisoned and unemployed, the family struggled from 1942 to 1943. Cordelia had to keep Sri Mataji and her siblings fed. She sold off parts of their house and had to sell her jewelry when one of the children fell ill. It was at this point that Sri Mataji quit college and threw herself fully into her activism. 
Perhaps inspired by Prasad, Sri Mataji wanted her debut as an activist to attract as much attention as possible. Quote, she decided to picket in front of her college and stop all of the students who were trying to enter. End quote. As the nationalist movement gained momentum, the principal was ordered by the British to suspend any student caught protesting. Suspension meant Sri Mataji would not be able to enroll into another college. The vice principal made an offer to Sri Mataji. The school would give her a college certificate, and in exchange, she would stop protesting. Sri Mataji refused and was suspended. But Baba Mama notes that there was another reason for her suspension. Like her father before her, Sri Mataji had crossed a line with a classmate, who just so happened to be related to someone in a position of power. He writes, quote, Mr. Paul was the director of education. Paul Jr. was a college classmate of Sri Mataji. She told Paul Jr. that if he were a true Indian, he would not go to class, but would help her pick it, end quote. Paul Jr. refused and criticized the Quit India movement, Sri Mataji and some female friends sarcastically offered Paul Jr. their jewelry, an attack on his masculinity. In India, wearing of bangles by men is synonymous with femininity, cowardice, and timidity. Paul Jr. reported the insult to his father, who enforced the suspension. Undeterred, Sri Mataji continued to protest. Once, she stood outside a high school with the Indian flag, insisting the students go home. A bus filled with students from out of town was due to arrive. Out of the corner of her eye, Sri Mataji saw the bus. She threw herself on the ground in front of the gate, so the bus could not drive onto campus without running her over first. Baba Mama hated the sight of his sister lying in the dirt. He said, quote, I decided to run home and bring a carpet to her. So I ran home and ran back, only to find that a lot of police were around Sri Mataji, end quote. She was arrested and reportedly tortured with ice slabs and electric shocks. As a female prisoner, Sri Mataji would have either seen or dealt with a variety of atrocities. According to author Suruchi Tapar Bjorkert, the jails were inhospitable with no bathrooms. Female inmates were routinely humiliated by the male guards and were often subjected to random body inspections. Even if the inmate was pregnant or menstruating at the time, there were no exceptions. There were many occasions where the inspectors forced themselves on young women. However, many of these inmates also realized the power they had as political prisoners of the fairer sex. As news of the Indian nationalist movement spread worldwide, so did the horrific stories of life in British jails, causing a rift between the British government in India and British Parliament. Lord Irwin, the Viceroy for India, commented that, quote, If the authorities wanted to create an atmosphere of goodwill, they should have released the ladies, even before they released Mahatma Gandhi, end quote. At the same time, the degradations of the female inmates not only established a strong fellowship among the incarcerated women, it also energized other women into joining the fight. They were courting arrest, and Tapar Bjorkert uses the Oxford English Dictionary to define courting as behaving as if trying to provoke something harmful. In this case, as the women prepared for protests, they also prepared for prison time. Many women, including Sri Mataji, saw their arrests as a badge of honor. This fervor was likely why, upon her release, Sri Mataji told her mother she was joining an underground movement. Perhaps Cordelia was proud of Sri Mataji for taking up the cause, or she was aware of the parental hypocrisy should she forbid Sri Mataji from joining India's fight for independence. Either way, Cordelia gave Sri Mataji the go-ahead. Sri Mataji would travel with protesters to spread anti-British propaganda. After a year of activism, Sri Mataji decided to return to school. Given her track record with nepotism, one doesn't have to wonder how she re-enrolled in college. More good news came when Prasad was finally released in December 1943. The prison diet had left him with ulcers, but he was determined to recover and even went back to practicing law. At last, the family could return to the lifestyle they enjoyed. In 1946, a 23-year-old Sri Mataji would meet 26-year-old civil servant and diplomat Chandrika C.P. Srivastava. 
They fell in love and were married on April 7, 1947. Then, on August 15, 1947, India was officially free of British rule. On December 22, 1947, Sri Mataji and CP had their first child, a daughter named Kalpana. Then, on January 30, 1948, came a devastating event that would shake the citizens of India to their core. Gandhi had left his home to attend a prayer meeting. Leaning on the shoulders of his granddaughter-in-law and grandniece, they were crossing up the steps of the Birla House, where Gandhi held his prayer meetings, when a young man stepped out of the shadows. The young man saluted Gandhi with a pranam, where one puts their palms together and touches the feet of the person they're greeting. The young man commented that Gandhi was late for prayer. Gandhi smiled and confirmed that he was late. And then the man pulled out a gun. The bullet struck Gandhi in his chest as the prayer assembly surrounded a dying Gandhi. His final act was to raise his hands in supplication. The funeral was set for the afternoon the next day. As Baba Mama recalls, there was a mad rush of people wanting to go to Delhi, where the funeral was held. The assassin would soon become known throughout the country. His name was Nathram Godse, and he was a Brahmin, a member of the same caste as the girls afraid to share lunch with Sri Mataji during her school days. Gandhi's death was likely devastating for Sri Mataji, as not only had she looked up to him like all of India, but she was special because she was his Nepali, the spitting image of the goddess Sita. Baba Mama recalls, quote, We were all glued to the radio and we had no sense of time or food or sleep. End quote. Sri Mataji allegedly met Gandhi the day before his assassination. He said to her, quote, Nepali, you are the same to look at and now you are a mother. When are you going to start your spiritual work? Now we are free and you should start whatever you wanted to do. End quote. Whether or not this conversation took place, this may have been when Sri Mataji decided that her dream of becoming a doctor was too small. She needed to set her sights higher. After all, Gandhi had supposedly said so. From the years 1948 to 1955, Sri Mataji was adrift. She started a farm, gave birth to a second daughter named Satana, and accompanied CP on various trips. As a politician's wife, Sri Mataji was supposed to smile and stay in the background. However, she was not content. Around this time, her father's health started to deteriorate, but he continued his practice. By January 1955, when Sri Mataji was 31, Prasad's health had taken a turn. <sighs> Baba Mama said, quote, I could hear his restless breathing, and so I went and asked him whether he needed any help but he, as usual, said he would be all right, end quote. He wasn't. Prasad was admitted to the hospital, vomiting blood. Sri Mataji kept a bedside vigil for her father. With all his children assembled, Prasad slipped into a coma. He died on February 17, 1955. Life went on for Sri Mataji. In 1961, at the age of 38, Sri Mataji was building a house in Lucknow, at the same time, her eldest daughter Kalpana was a student of Indian mystic Bhagwan Rajneesh, known to his followers as Osho. Around this time, she met the guru named Rajneesh, who upon meeting Sri Mataji said, quote, O mother Adi Shakti, I've been looking forward to meet you for so long, and today my dream is fulfilled, end quote. Then he threw himself at her feet. In Indian mythology, Adi Shakti is the supreme deity. Worshippers would throw themselves before her statue and worship her. Rajneesh was essentially worshipping Sri Mataji, but Sri Mataji didn't see herself as a goddess and was put off by Rajneesh's dramatics. So much so that Sri Mataji would later denounce Rajneesh to her disciples as one of the demonic gurus who would lead them astray. Although their meeting had been an odd one, it would later resonate with Sri Mataji in ways that would change the course of her spirituality and charity. In 1962, at the age of 39, Sri Mataji arranged a marriage for Baba Mama to a woman named Kamud. With her father deceased, Baba Mama consulted with Sri Mataji throughout the entire process. Baba Mama and Kamud were married on October 16, 1963. 
It would not be the last time Srimataji would play matchmaker. On May 27, 1964, the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, passed away. His successor, Lal Bahadur Shastri, took office on June 9. In his first months as Prime Minister, Shastri had fallen ill. Sri Mataji convinced CP to travel to visit Shastri in New Delhi. The two men hit it off, and Shastri named CP as his joint secretary. While CP worked for Shastri from 1964 to 1969, Sri Mataji became involved in social work. In Bombay, she became president of a charity called Friends of the Blind. She used her name and connections to collect donations and have the blind trained in massage therapy. In Meerut, she opened a home for refugees seeking political asylum and a home for the disabled. She also opened a home for leprosy victims. Maybe this was her true calling. On October 1969, Kalpana got married and Sri Mataji threw her a lavish wedding. Throughout the years, Sri Mataji nurtured an interest in spirituality, but was conflicted about the gurus. Why did they fail to address finding peace from within, she wondered. She was also skeptical about how these gurus knew they were the ones to lead others to salvation. What divine order had granted them this power? Speaking of gurus, it was Rajneesh who would later ironically be the catalyst that led Sri Mataji to create Sahaja Yoga. In 1970, Sri Mataji was 47. Rajneesh, who had not forgotten Sri Mataji since their encounter in 1963, was holding a seminar in Nargol. He called CP nonstop because he wanted Sri Mataji to attend. She was reluctant, but CP insisted that she go so Rajneesh would stop harassing them. Sri Mataji attended the seminar on May 5, 1970. She watched in disgust as Rajneesh manipulated his disciples. Later that night, she slipped away from the seminar for some alone time on a Nargol beach. She sat under a banyan tree. It was then that Sri Mataji received her revelation. She felt her Sahasrara, also known as the crown chakra, open like a lotus flower. Inside the flower were 1,000 lamps. The glow from these lamps burst forth from her head. The lotus was replaced by another flower with 1,000 petals. Sri Mataji felt the cool vibrations from this flower. Her spiritual energy grew. She became one with these vibrations. Sri Mataji knew that this was the Param Chaitanya, or pure vibrations, which made her the Adi Shakti, or primordial energy. This spur-of-the-moment revelation led to the name and creation of Sahaja Yoga. Sahaja meaning spontaneous, and yoga meaning union of the self. Sri Mataji, of course, saw herself as the only one who could help others discover themselves. Everything she had done up to now was all just a distraction from her true purpose. However, she was smarter than your average spiritual leader. She knew that calling herself a goddess with no proof would raise eyebrows. So Sri Mataji returned to her mundane life and waited for her moment to shine. We'll return to our story in just a moment from the ParCast Network. And now, back to our story. At the beginning of 1970, Sri Mataji was awaiting enlightenment. That moment came when in-laws paid a visit. Sri Mataji asked to pay respect to her elders. As per the Hindu tradition, she would pull her sari over her head and touch their feet as a blessing. However, her offer was rejected. One of the in-laws had a dream where Sri Mataji appeared to him as a goddess who could cure illness, so they touched her feet instead. Later, this in-law reported that his wife's cancer was cured thanks to Sri Mataji. In fact, one of the biggest draws to Sahaja Yoga were these personal fables. Ironically, Sri Mataji used a time-honored tactic of the gurus she despised. According to Indian psychoanalyst and author Sudhir Kakar, quote, the gurus themselves would look at the healing of sickness as a necessary bait for their proper task of leading a person towards self-realization, end quote. News of her healing abilities spread throughout the family. However, while the attention made Sri Mataji happy, there was a problem. The healings were attributed to her and not to her spiritual energy. This would not satisfy Sri Mataji, although she was aware that this was great publicity. 
A woman Baba Mama calls Mrs. Oak became the first to accept Sri Mataji as her spiritual leader. No one at the time questioned Sri Mataji, which Kakar notes as a cultural quirk. He says, quote, truth or reality is attested to by the authority of tradition, which in India does not take second place to empirical verification as a category of proof, end quote. In other words, the rest of the family fell in line with their elders, who were absolutely convinced Sri Mataji had powers. Even with these supposed powers, Sri Mataji could not prevent the tragedies that befell her family. In October 1970, Kalpana was expecting a baby girl, but the child was born with a hole in her heart. Under the advice of local doctors, Sri Mataji had flown with her grandchild to the United States for the operation. Sadly, the baby did not survive. Then, in the same month, Cordelia had fallen ill. Sri Mataji had just returned from the failed operation to save her grandchild. Cordelia passed away on October 11, 1970. When she visited Baba Mama in Tehran later that year, he initially attributed her detachment to grief. However, as Sri Mataji would tell her brother over coffee, she had achieved self-realization and had already taken on 12 disciples. Baba Mama called his friends, several of whom knew of Sri Mataji, to arrange a meet and greet over dinner. The next day, almost 20 people had shown up. These friends worked in the Embassy of India in Tehran, the United Nations, the travel industry, and in the press. At dinner, Baba Mama claims that Sri Mataji performed miracles, like healing a woman's arthritis. Thanks to the clout of Baba Mama's friends, every English language newspaper in Tehran printed stories of Sri Mataji with eyewitness accounts of her miracles. Baba Mama came home to find a line of people waiting outside of his apartment for an audience with Sri Mataji. In 1973, a 50-year-old Sri Mataji returned to Nagpur with CP, their daughters, and her disciples. The disciples would close off a room to perform a puja, or Hindu ceremonial worship of Sri Mataji. Outsiders were not to interfere. Their presence would disrupt the flow of vibrations. The secrecy would grow, along with the number of her disciples. In 1974, Sri Mataji and her family moved to London after CP became the Secretary General of the United Nations International Maritime Organization. 51 and undaunted as ever, she continued her seminars and healings. By 1979, a 56-year-old Sri Mataji was telling her London disciples, quote, I am the one who is Adi Shakti, who is mother of all the mothers, who has incarnated on this earth to give meaning to itself, to this creation, to human beings, end quote. Sri Mataji had graduated to a full-blown God complex, a delusion her disciples supported. One such disciple, a Swiss man named Grégoire de Kalbermatten, referred to Sri Mataji as O Supremest One and Her Holiness in his book The Advent, an official novel about Sahaja Yoga written with the approval of Sri Mataji. Sahaja Yogis would pray to a shrine of Sri Mataji in their homes about once a day. In the evenings, they would soak their feet in warm salt water and place lemons and chilies under their beds, all to ward off evil spirits and negative energy. Sri Mataji denounced these threats to her disciples as tantrikas, or occultists who use spirits to gather information on those around them. Those especially vulnerable to tantrikas were the hypocrites, the promiscuous, and the wealthy. In fact, many of the threats were against the wicked influence of corrupt Western ideals and false gurus like Rajneesh. What made Sri Mataji so effective as a cult leader was the way she instilled a familial bond between herself and her disciples. Perhaps, remembering her childhood role as head of the house, Sri Mataji had her disciples refer to each other as brothers and sisters. She called them her children, and in turn, they would call her mother. It should come as no surprise that several of the Sahaja yogis had dysfunctional relationships with their own families. In his interview with a disciple named Amita, she said of her family, quote, My mother was a hot-tempered, dried-up woman with little human sympathy or kindness, end quote. 
In contrast, Amita described Sri Mataji as the cloud that gives rain to everyone. In 1984, Sri Mataji held a seminar in Bombay. There were about 300 local Sahaja yogis and about 60 foreign Sahaja yogis in attendance. This seminar started the same as every future seminar would. A foreign Sahaja yogi appeared before the audience to denounce India's present in favor of its spiritual past. This would segue into how Sri Mataji would protect them from evil outside forces. She styled herself after the Hindu goddess Durga, a multi-armed goddess who wielded ten weapons, the goddess who rescued Sita from Ravana, the king of demons. The implication, says Kakar, was that Sri Mataji was the protective mother, shielding her children from all evil. The foreign disciples were easy to spot among the crowd. Sri Mataji made them wear white kurta pajamas, made from khadi, the same material her parents wore. These kurta pajamas would turn red as the foreign Sahaji yogis knelt at the feet of Sri Mataji. At the end of every seminar, the lights are turned low. The disciples are asked to shut their eyes and stretch out their hands toward Sri Mataji. She coaxes them with her resonating voice, quote, I am your mother. Leave all your problems and worries in my lap. Become thoughtless. Concentrate all your attention on me, end quote. Sri Mataji would then shift gears to talk about the vibrations. She repeatedly intoned hypnotic suggestions to her disciples. Could they feel how heavy their hands were getting? Could they feel the cool sensation at their fingertips? To drive the point home, Sri Mataji blew into the microphone as she implored her disciples to relax and wait for the breeze. Sri Mataji remedied any skepticism using isolation and shaming tactics. She would light an oil lamp, and those who said they could not feel the vibrations were forced to open their eyes and stare into the fire. This was her version of the eye fixation technique used in hypnosis. The intense focus would create a rapport with the fire and with Sri Mataji, who always made sure to position herself behind the oil lamp when reciting her spiel. According to Kakar, quote, because of the emotional pressures created in a group setting, the tendency to identify with the experience of other group members and the intense desire to please the leader, only a handful of people hold out against the power of suggestion, end quote. Sri Mataji introduced Sahaja Yoga to Europe, Australia, and North America in the 1980s. In January 1986, Sri Mataji had a group of foreign disciples hard at work on the construction of Pratishthan, a palace-like home that she named in honor of the capital of her ancestors. Every floor would represent a chakra. Every room would be a petal on that chakra. And her own bedroom would be the primordial energy. Sri Mataji would make Pratishthan her home for the next 24 years. In 1987, Sahaja Yoga would gather more British followers. As Sri Mataji had done with her brother, she arranged the marriages of several of her disciples. In other cases, she also broke up any existing relationships she felt were a threat to her disciples' spiritual energy. With her English collective, there was an influx of children. Twenty-nine babies had been born into Sahaja Yoga, while another 56 children were brought in by their parents. She advised their parents to adopt a hands-off approach. Quote, the children are mine, not yours. So you just don't get involved with them. That's a temptation on you." End quote. Indoctrination started when the children turned two years old. They were made to sleep in a separate room from their parents and raised as one unit. All the adult disciples were aunties and uncles to every child. The children had to learn by watching their perfect aunties and uncles. The demand from her disciples to have their children educated in an environment free from outside corruption led Sri Mataji to open the International Sahaja Public School in 1990, located in Dharamshala near the Himalayas. An average day for a student at the International Sahaja Public School started around 5.30 to 6 a.m. and ended at 9 p.m. Aside from the usual curriculum, the students were graded on how well they meditated, their ability to thrive in a group, and self-esteem. It was unclear as to who was looking after the welfare of the children. In 1992, a representative from INFORM, 
a British charity that collects neutral information on new religions, interviewed a group of British Sahaja yogis who had sent their children to the International Sahaja Public School. It was clear that none of the parents knew who was educating their children or how many students were in the classes. However, they weren't worried. One mother said, quote, Shri Mataji is looking after the children, so of course they're all right, end quote. Though some of the disciples maintained that the local villagers were taking care of the children, a 1995 Austrian report revealed that the school turned away outsiders. The students could write letters to their parents at least once a week, yet they were denied access to television and radio. This was all to keep them from experiencing negative influences on their vibrations. Though the parents appeared confident in public, in private there were fears expressed about the school. Not all the teachers were Sahaja yogis as they were originally told. There were other contradictions. The students were supposed to learn independence through modeling their behavior after their teachers. However, the teachers were hardly ever around, so the students were left to raise themselves. For the rest of the 1990s, Sri Mataji would take Sahaja Yoga to South America, Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia. She posed with children in photographs, gave them Indian names, and allowed them to sit on her lap during festivities. To celebrate Sri Mataji, the children would sing, dance, or act in plays. A young disciple told her birth mother, you're not the best mother, because Sri Mataji is. But soon, Sri Mataji's image as a perfect mother would crumble, as allegations of child abuse nipped at her heels, and the controversial teachings of Sri Mataji threatened to usurp her reign. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Paul Liebeskind, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Cults is written by Simone Fournelier and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. And here it is, your preview of mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess Athena. I hope you like it. It was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycolos. Athena had a divine, godly strength, 
plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. She'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war, and it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain. Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. Every Tuesday, we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today, we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of Parcast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At Parcast, we are grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive, and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself, taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine, and this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache, and Zeus's son Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. 
Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, Oh, headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. Make it stop. End it. Cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Ah! Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought, and ready to fight for her life. Yet because the Greek gods are modeled on humans, with human flaws and emotions, There is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother, so after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, So Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing, lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! (laughs) Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch us spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like palace to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. 
The Proud Fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around, intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice. And dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. I don't understand why you... She's going to fall in the water. A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas's sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. Getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.